Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming on this beautiful day to worship. I'm always pleased with those who continue to come, even though they might be pulled to the hiking trails. So thank you for being here, and we're glad that you've chosen to spend this hour with us. We want to say a special welcome to any visiting who are here in person, and also to our members and visitors online. Let's look at the camera and let them see your faces. They love that part. Hello, hello, we're glad you're here. Um, as always, there's a lot going on in the life of the church. Now, I know for a fact that there are many artists and photographers in this congregation, right? Yes. yes. Next week is Creation Care Sunday, and as you, if you've been here before, the, the church will be full of nature photos and paintings, some from children, some for adults. The deadline to get those in is today. So go through all your art and then send it in to the office, or if it's a digital picture, uh, email it to Kathy. This is Kathy. Um, we'll have a great time next week. Um, let me see what my other ones are. Okay, so some people will say, I, I don't feel connected to the church. I don't know many people. There are many ways to get to know many people. We have a book club that's coming up. Let me think of what, how to say this name. Beneficence is the book. I've read the book. I read it in about two days. That's how good it is. So if you're looking to meet people, come and just have a great discussion about that great book. Another way is Tuesday night we are having a vacation Bible camp team meeting. If you want to be on the team, you get to be on the team. And it's a fun bunch of people. Amen to that, everyone, right? And let me tell you, the kids, it's one of the most fun weeks. Rummage sale and VBC. Those are my two favorite weeks of the year. So if you'd like to just show up to that meeting at 7, seven o'clock in the youth lounge. As always, take a look at what's going on in the life of the church, and at this time I want to invite Paul Crumhouse up for a moment for the mission of the church. Good morning. On Rebuilding Day, Saturday, April 27th, volunteers from three churches, Ravensward Baptist, John Calvin Presbyterian and Providence Presbyterian will come together to work on a house. We've assigned a project that's a little smaller this year. It will be an adult group home and we're going to be building a large patio cover from scratch and doing some indoor painting. If you might enjoy painting or carpentry, we'd like to invite you. You can volunteer for a half day, 8.30 to 12.30, or 12.30 to 5, or for a full day. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you can talk to me after the service. Uh, if you want to commit, send me an email. My uh, email address is in the, uh, in the bulletin uh, under rebuilding. Uh, I'll respond with a, an email giving you details on the location of the house, uh, tools that uh, we're soliciting for those who have them, and so forth. The house is in Springfield, by the way. It's a relatively easy commute from here. Again, thank you for considering that opportunity.
Please join me in the call to worship. Sing your joy. Forgive your neighbor. Live your hope. Where we remember the love of God. So let our worship continue in joy. Courage is the ability to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. Let us be brave, confessing the story of our lives to the God who hears our whole story and loves us completely. Trusting in God's grace, let us join together and say together the prayer of confession. Loving God, we confess at times we do not share in the joy of the resurrection, but are caught in the worries of the world. We confess that we do not always live in the spirit of new life, but remain discontented, grumbling, and anxious. Forgive us for not sharing in the good news. Forgive us when we find it more comfortable to worry and complain than to risk the joy and encouragement of new life in Christ. Call us back to your ways, God, to seek hope and reconciliation, restoration, and peace. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen.
Let us take a moment of silent confession. Christ is risen, the stone is rolled away, the tomb found empty. Mary calls out, I have seen the Lord. We have seen Christ too in every helping hand, in every heartfelt gift, in every choice to restore life in this world. We are called to this new life, a life of forgiveness and reconciliation. You are forgiven, accept your forgiveness and know that God loves you and desires great joy for your life. Walk forward in this journey of faith, knowing that God and your community walk with you. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. The first reading is Psalm 133 in the Old Testament, and it can be found on page 575 of your Pew Bible. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes, It's like the dew of Ermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore.
sermon today comes from the one line in the song that says, he shows his wounded hands and names me as his own. Uh, Jean did not know what I was preaching on today, uh, especially since the passage that I'm preaching on was last week's lectionary. So that's what God does. Whether we've discussed it or not, somehow the Spirit makes our music match. Thank you so much, Jean and the choir and Jane. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were shut again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Of course that's how he answered him, right? Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So if you have teenagers or have raised teenagers, uh, where's the best place to talk to them? Yep, in the car. Captivated, aren't they? Trapped, they would say. Well, when Elena was um, 12 years old, she turned the tables on me. We were leaving the Mexican restaurant. We had been sitting side by side for an hour, and when we got into the car and started to drive away, She said, somewhat quietly, Mom. I said, yes. She said, I don't think I believe in God. I thought for a moment, and I said, Elena, thank you for trusting me with that information. And then I said, Your relationship with God is between you and God. And my job is to help you in any way I can. And then I said, are you having some doubts? And she said, yes. And I said, do you want to talk about it? And she said, no. I said, okay and we drove along. I think, if truth be told, what she really wanted and did not get was a big old rise out of her pastor mother. (laughs) Truth be told, for about 15 seconds, there was a big old rise out of her pastor mother. So today we have the story of Thomas. I'm just going to tell you, I will take Thomas over pretty much any other disciple, betraying Judas, denying Peter, no, no thank you, and what about the others in the Bible? 
needy Nicodemus, codependent Martha, why are they not known by their qualifiers? I have said to many people in my office in pastoral care moments that one moment in your life, one decision in your life, or one mistake in your life does not define your, the entirety of who you are. But evidently, it does define Thomas, right? I grew up thinking that doubt was bad. In fact, in my early Southern Baptist upbringing, I was explicitly told not to be like Thomas. Anybody else in this boat? I'm so happy to see that. His reluctance to accept that his fellow, what his fellow disciples told him, his reticence, his need to see to believe were seen as spiritual shortcomings. As a second grader, I did not know what spiritual shortcomings were, but I did understand that doubt was bad, which quickly translated to, I am bad because I doubt. Sometimes our journey with God includes undoing harmful church teachings. Now, Thomas was called the twin. It's like this random fact that was thrown into that story. And while it remains a mystery as to who that twin was, modern scholars have suggested that the twin is best translated as mirror. In that Thomas mirrors what is in us, our doubt, and our yearning for a real experience of God. Our yearning to see, to believe. In the book of Thomas, or the Gospel of Thomas, which did not obviously make it into our canon, it is said that the twin is Jesus himself. Because in that book, J Jesus says to Thomas, now, since it has been said that you are my twin and true companion, examine yourself. If indeed this is true, imagine, imagine Thomas's suffering when all the others got to see Jesus and he missed it. His true companion returns from the dead and he misses it. What pain was underneath his unbelief? Was it painful every time each disciple told their version of the encounter? Was it pain or rather fear that he had missed the one chance he had? Was he fearful that the one he loved the most was gone for good? Was his unbelief in some way a protector? Well, if it's untrue, then I don't have to feel so much pain. For seven days he suffered, and on the eighth day Jesus walked through an unopened door into the room of fearful disciples and said, Peace be with you. I don't know about you, but I probably would have believed when he walked through the unopened door. He walked in and he gave Thomas exactly what he needed and then he said, do not doubt, but believe. Mm. 2,000 years of in interpretation and that one line has defined Thomas. Now you know, for me, belief is a hard word. There are a lot of things people say they believe, but then when you see their actions, you say, but do they really? Sometimes it's my actions that people are saying, does she really? Belief is this kind of intellectual assent. There is another way to interpret that word. Instead of belief, you can use the word trust. The, di the difference in belief and trust is that belief is this intellectual assent and trust involves a relationship. Now, knowing Jesus, what do you think he would prefer? Belief, intellectual assent, or trust, 
a relationship. Trust. Trust. A relationship. My friend Reverend Doe Thomas says that what strikes me most about Thomas' story is not that he doubted, but he did so publicly without shame and without guilt. Sometimes I doubt the presence of God. Anybody want to share their doubt? Feel free. Okay, so you know how vulnerable it was for, Th <laughs> for Thomas to share his doubt. So you know what kind of community that was that he felt safe enough to share his doubt. So what is amazing, and this is still from Debbie Thomas, is that his faith community, community allowed him to do so. And what I love about Jesus' response is that he met Thomas right where he was, freely offering the disciple the testimony of his own scars and his own pain. And after such an encounter, I can only imagine the tenderness and urgency with which Thomas was able to repeat Christ's words to other doubters. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Because isn't that all of us two Sundays after Easter? Don't we all wrestle with hidden doubts and hidden fears? Don't we all wonder sometimes if the miracle of resurrection will hold in ordinary time? Because if you have eyes and you have a heart, sometimes believing in resurrection is hard. There's bleeding from gun violence. There's hungry children from unjust policies. There are wars where civilians are targeted. We could go through an entire list and it could go forever, couldn't it? Sometimes it is hard to believe in resurrection. But here's the thing about John. All of his gospel, the whole of his gospel, is that we might come to believe, or I would say we might come to trust. We might come to have such a relationship with Jesus that despite what we see, we still have hope. Because you know what this, this passage gives us? Scars and pain. Isn't it true that sometimes when we think back on our scars and our pain and we've come to the other side of whatever that was, not unaffected, but different, new in a way, isn't that sometimes where we understand resurrection in a smaller way? Isn't it sometimes the scars and the pain that move us forward in trust and belief? There are two, when I think about Elena, there were two things that I wish I had told her. Well, there's probably 25 things I wish I had told her. I wish I'd quoted her, the two, my two favorite quotes on doubt. Frederick Beatner says, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith, keeps it moving. And Paul Tillich, one of my favorite theologians, said that doubt is the ventilator of faith. It gives it room to breathe. 
I'm guessing as a 12-year-old, she wouldn't have cared about those. (laughs) But I do. Jesus wasn't chastising Thomas. Jesus was meeting him exactly where he was and where he needed Jesus to be. His faith community was meeting him exactly where he was and where he needed them to be, and vice versa. So Thomas says, if you're finding the joy of Easter difficult to access right now, rest in the fact that Thomas took his time. Lean into the amazing truth that Jesus allowed him to do so. Hang on to the fact that Jesus opened a way for Thomas through the marks of his own suffering and trauma so that Thomas could find his own way to wholeness and to trust. Consider the impact and the attractiveness of a faith community that holds space for the wary and the skeptical. skeptical. And contemplate the wonderful story of a determined doubter who gradually, gradually, a little bit at a time, found his way to faith, who came to see the wounded one as Lord and God in his own time. The story that comes after Easter is about scars and pain and coming to faith. What a gift that is. Amen? Let us remain standing and say what we believe using the affirmation of faith found printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, like the disciples, we are gathered together in these post-Easter weeks, sometimes wondering whether it is true, marveling at the possibility and daring to hope. And like the disciples, we are sometimes afraid and sometimes full of doubt. But in your extravagant generosity, your boundless love, you hold us in our fear and love us in our doubts and grant us your peace. Thank you for loving us as we are. Teach us not to hide from our doubt, but to recognize it as a door to mystery and to a deeper faith. After all, the disciples' fear became a visitation as they saw you among them, risen and triumphant. Thomas' doubt became a moment of revelation as he saw and touched you and finally trusted you. This morning we pray for those in our society who have no faith at all. There are so many people who live without hope, without knowledge of your resurrection, without your light in their lives. So God, grant us the courage to live as Easter people within our doubt, within our struggles, within our scars and pain, sharing those moment, moments when we see your presence, when we know we've made it through because of you. We pray for those who find it difficult to believe. Lord knows that they are not alone, but in the best of company, as even Christ's own disciples struggled to believe. Loving Christ in your presence that removes all fear and erases all doubt, come and continue to grant us your presence and your peace. God, there are many things in the world that are hard and feel overwhelming. We only have to look with our eyes and see with our heart to see the wounds and the pain. God, as we see out into the world with what is going on, help us to see others' wounds and pain as your wounds and pain, and help us to do everything in our power to ease someone else's pain. God, we take just a moment in silence to pray for those who are in our hearts and minds. Gracious God, you know our belief and our unbelief, so it is with confidence that we pray in the name of your Son, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I recently had the humbling experience of taking on the coordination of memorial services hosted here at Providence from two longtime leaders who had been in this volunteer job for over 25 years. Pretty big shoes to fill. But they leave me not just with their experience and continuing help, but a dedicated band of volunteers that help us serve members in their time of sadness. I am reminded yet again of what generous people we have here at Providence who give not just with their treasure, but with their time, energy, and wisdom. And with a grateful thank you for all that share their gifts, the morning offering will now be collected. and holy God for such abundance we thank you and help us and ask you to help us to, to help us to live in a way that our very lives share your faith hope and love help us to use these monetary resources out in the world so that all may come to trust in you for we pray this in Jesus name amen <laughs> Before I do the benediction. Matt is planning a class called Heathens, Heretics, and Doubters. We'll have some more information on that in the bulletin soon. And I, today is Gospel Music Sunday in the other service, and I know we have double dippers who come to this one and that one, so we welcome everyone. So go now in peace with your doubts and with your belief. Know that God loves you where and as you are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say...